All right, everyone, we're going to begin uh, the commencement of our graduation ceremony now. Um, we're going to have Brian take the mic here in a second. And uh, after that, we'll have our lovely graduate, Mr. Daniel Marcus, walk on. Um, yeah, can you get a round of applause? Yeah! Daniel. All right, so just want to thank you all so much for being here and thank everyone for bringing food, drinks, refreshments, your family, yourselves. Uh, you can't have family fun day without family. And I like to think we're all one big family here at the school. So thank you guys all so much for coming. It's so great to see all of you out here. I look forward to this day a lot every year. So, all right, I'm going to hand the mic off to our lovely founder, director, president, leader, um, fascist overlord, Brian. That's not true at all. They want me to stand on this X. I'm very hesitant to do this. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, introduction, Gavin. Um, we are here today, of course, to honor uh, one of our original students, uh, Daniel Marcus. Uh, we, as of this afternoon, our school has finished its eighth school year. Um, and Daniel has been a part of the school since virtually the beginning, um, so this is a historic day, long time coming, but I think um, in terms of preparation for this day, uh, Daniel has gone uh, far above and beyond. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, every year we've done this, uh, almost, we, we've kind of changed the graduation requirements and kind of honed them a little bit each year, and so as of right now, we have you know, a somewhat rigorous set of requirements of things that people have to do if they want to get a diploma from here and get the, the gown. Um, and uh, not only was Daniel part of the entire democratic process of discussing them and uh, implementing some of those policies, um, he also fulfilled uh, all of them we could think of, even though uh, I think, you know, he only had to do one adventure or one capstone project. Of course, he did both. Uh, and he also wrote a um, wonderful, uh, marvelous senior thesis that he's going to adapt and present for you in a moment. Um, he worked really hard on it, and uh, the hard work absolutely paid off. Um, we have a recording on, you know, actually I think it's in our photo album, but it was when Daniel first delivered this speech um, was over here on Chapel Island. This was a beautiful sunny day and the whole school came, uh, sat and listened to him. He went off on the little stage and, you know, just kind of shared his whole story with all of us and it was marvelous. And then of course we all voted. Um, oh, actually, we did a Q&A, so we always ask the, the thesis writer some questions, maybe, you know, ask for more details about certain events. And uh, after that we take an anonymous vote. And of course, Daniel, passed, was voted, graduated by flying colors. So before we hand it off to him, let's give him one more big round of applause. I mean, I'll, I'll probably have more to say about Daniel on the flip side. See you on the flip side, Dan. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, this is strange. I am on the X. Thank you, Gavin, for drawing the X. So, um... This is weird because I've been coming to the school for almost eight years and I've seen so many people do this exact thing of reading this, I filmed it, and it's just strange that it's like, I'm doing it now, but hopefully I can kind of live up to everyone else's, which I think I did. Um, last time I read this, I cried, so we'll see what happens here. But um, enjoy, thank you. Um, before I start reading it, like Brian said, uh, the requirements are usually have always been a thesis, but we added an extra one, which was the capstone project or adventure. I did do both. My capstone project was my film Minestrone. It's wonderful. Thank you. Fifty ninety nine on Amazon. Thank you. And I also did, uh, or at least did most of the organizing of uh, Longwood Gardens trip, which we hadn't done a field trip in a while since COVID kind of crushed all of our field tripping. You know. Uh, thing, you know, our, uh, our drive to do a field trip, but we did it, and I think we had a pretty nice time. So, um, yes, so uh, thank you all the chaperones for coming to do that again. That was super fun. Um, okay, 
I think let's just uh, rip the Band-Aid off here. Okay, ready? This thesis is titled um, Untitled SJSS Thesis, uh, written by Daniel Marcus, because for anyone who's read anything I've written, it almost never has a title until the very end. And this one doesn't have a title. So uh, let's do this. Everyone can hear me good? Okay, thank you. Um, this should be like half an hour long, so you know, have fun. Um, Take a seat. Okay, without further ado, let's do this. Okay, prologue. Before I say anything, el anything else, I must admit that this is not the first time I've written this thesis. I've actually been writing this in my head for many years now. For those who don't know, a Sudbury thesis is meant to be the graduate's final statement to the school and its community about their experience before and during Sudbury and where they think their lives will be headed after. It's the most important part of the graduation process and gets talked a lot about within the school. When asked if I was nervous to write my thesis, I would say no. In fact, I've been excited to write mine ever since we, as a school, made it part of, a graduate, part of graduation years ago. My only real worry when writing this thesis does not come from a lack of ideas, but more from an overabundance of them. Out of all the paragraphs I've penned in my mind before falling asleep, and the seemingly endless amount of random anecdotes that I think of that I just have to include, what are the right things to say? How can I fully express my opinion on something that has had such a profound impact on my life. How do I truly know I've said everything I want to say? In the end, I've realized that it's impossible to convey all my thoughts and feelings about Sudbury. So that's why I will probably continue to write and rewrite this thesis in my head throughout my life. The one you're hearing now is just the, ver the version I decided to write down at this point in time. Okay. Part one, before Sudbury. Before I went to elementary school, I always saw myself as a wild kid, or at least I thought that in my four to five year old child's head. In actuality, I don't know if I or anyone can accurately describe what kind of a person they were at that young of an age. Maybe I thought it was different from other kids or somehow rebellious. I wrestled with my brothers and would randomly pretend to drop dead. I also said some bad words like crap, or maybe it was seven women say, when I would say that, I don't remember. The one thing I do know is that I felt free, free to be and express myself without care. I have a vivid memory of my first day of kindergarten. I was nervous when being dropped off in the school lobby, but as the day went on, I got used to the foreign environment and felt a little better. The thing I remember most from that day was when all the kindergartners were being lined up in the gymnasium, getting ready to be carted off to the next random, meaningless room. While standing in this line, I watched multiple children get in trouble with the school aides probably for not standing in line or just generally misbehaving. <laughs> the more I watched, the more I understood the simple concept that if you don't listen to the AIDS instructions, you got in trouble. Or you didn't listen to the AIDS instructions, you got in trouble. Considering this line consisted of 55-year-olds, this cycle of misbehavior behavior continued for some time. At that moment, I had a realization. I should be good, I thought. It would be a waste of time to not be, to not listen to the adults' directions. Otherwise, I'll just end up being like the kid stepping out of line, always being reprimanded for misbehaving. It would be pointless for me to act like those kids I thought. I might as well do what the teachers say. It'll be easier for me that way, because here I have no control. In the years since, I've talked to my dad about this moment. He said I lost a part of myself when I first joined school in my effort to be good. For the next five years, I continued to be good in elementary school. I got good grades and the teachers liked me. I was a good student. While I was in kindergarten, I became fixated with Spider-Man and then with all superheroes. With that came the superhero movies. I was so obsessed with these superhero movies that I would watch copious amounts of YouTube videos discussing them. And in those videos, they would also talk about non-superhero movies. After watching so many of them, I remember thinking, maybe I should make movies when I grow up. It definitely wasn't some sort of grand epiphany. I just thought it was probably a good idea. <laughs> as, my love and film, uh, as my love of film and storytelling grew, in general grew into something bigger, writing naturally became my favorite subject. It was the one part of my day where I was actually allowed to use even the slightest bit of creativity. I much preferred it to having to poorly paint a copy of Van Gogh's Sunflowers. I could take a blank page and write a story about things that I was actually interested in. 
Fiction was my favorite type of writing, but even when I was forced to write a horribly robotic essay about some dull subject, or a nonfiction story about whatever ride you rode in Orlando on your last vacation, it was still better than nothing. One memory from my time in public school that has stuck with me over the years happened in fourth grade. My teacher was showing us our new write, uh, assignment of writing an adventure story. I was immediately excited and started thinking of things like Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park, you know, something fun and interesting. As we read through the sample story in our textbooks, the whole class immediately became upset. The short story consisted of the main characters getting on the subway, realizing they'd gotten on the wrong train, getting off and taking the correct train, and ending with them finally arriving in Times Square. This was, supposed, this was supposed to be an example of an A-plus adventure story, but it was easily one of the most dull pieces of writing I've ever read. Everyone knew it was bad, and the class started arguing with the teacher about the poor story. I think she probably thought the same as us, but that didn't stop her from giving many half-hearted rebuttals. Later that day, for some unrelated reason, she decided to punish the whole class, even though it was probably only one or two kids who'd actually been misbehaving. Instead of going out for a measly 25-minute recess, we were forced to walk up and down the school hallways in an even more perfectly straight line than our normally perfectly straight line. Anytime someone even slightly stepped out of it, we were made to walk for another five mi minutes, all while our teacher made condescending and almost maniacally sadistic remarks about how much fun this was. After the, as this was happening, I continued to debate with my teacher about the adventure story assignment. I just couldn't understand why we were meant to strive for such a low bar with our stories. Eventually, my teacher responded, don't take this so seriously. You guys aren't real writers. I felt immediately disheartened. For years, our teachers tried to convince us that we we're all real writers, real artists. To see one blatantly contradict that and say something so discouraging to a child she loved writing, uh, she knew loved writing, was incredibly disappointing. That year continued with more cruel punishments. The aides would make everyone sit on the curb next to the playground while everyone else got to play. Or even worse, made the whole class sit with our... Made the whole class uh, sit with our heads on our desks with the lights off. If anyone put their heads up, they would add another five minutes. The fact that the adults were allowed to treat kids like this is absolutely unacceptable. From then on, any enjoyment I got from going to school, which wasn't that much to begin with, never felt the same. I started to resent how we were treated more than I had before. The way they talked to us, the way they'd punish everyone when most had done nothing wrong. Eventually I decided some of these issues should be discussed. I gathered some other students who felt the same and scheduled a meeting with the principal. We were going to talk, about the, talk to him about our unreasonably short recess and the unfair punishments. We wanted to actually try and make change. The meeting lasted five minutes and I only said two sentences. He talked and talk, talked, but it was all one big non-answer. From the moment we stepped into his office, he knew he was never going to listen to what we had to say. It was then when I finally realized that nothing was ever going to change. The illusion that we had any say faded away. I cared so much, but I could do so little. Every day felt like more of a chore. I was in a box with no way out. Over the years, I would have the same thought, although now it permeated through my mind more and more. How am I going to spend the next decade of my life in a place like this? The first time I heard about Sudbury was from my older brother, Dylan. He had left middle school halfway through sixth grade and had been at home un unschooling himself for about a year. After looking at different types of alternative education, he learned about Sudbury schools, and there just so happened to be one opening right near us. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in a small conference room inside a local library with a young mustachioed man sitting in front of us. <laughs> he started talking about the soon-to-be South Jersey Sudbury school. As he, ex as he explained the completely alien philosophy of Sudbury, the man and his daughter next to us, who were also the only other people in the room, asked a question. What if a kid only wants to play soccer all day? The mustachioed man, man, who also happened to go by the name of Brian, responded, well, they would be allowed to do that. That's stupid, I thought. Even with the gripes <laughs> I had with public school, the concept of letting a child do, what, uh, do whatever they want all day made no sense to me. The strange thing was, it, was that I probably couldn't give a concrete reason why I thought that idea was stupid, other than a gut feeling. That just can't be right, I thought. Looking back, I think my reason for feeling that way was because I didn't know there was an alternative traditional school. All I knew was that school is school, and that's the way kids learn. It was only when Dylan, and subsequently my younger brother Andrew, officially enrolled in the fledgling school that I saw there was another way. <clears throat> now it was only me in public school, and I started to feel an inner turmoil inside myself. 
For months, I went back and forth on whether I should stay or go to Sudbury. On one hand, I saw how my brothers were thriving in that environment and knew I probably could too. On the other hand, something felt wrong about leaving public school. I had been going for so long and thought maybe I should just stick with what I had. It was the ultimate sunk cost for me. Eventually, I decided I would go to Sudbury, but only after I completed fifth grade. It was my last year in elementary school, so I thought I, at le I should at least finish with what I started. My mom liked this idea, and it was only when she came in for parent visitation day that she changed her mind. <laughs> my fifth grade teacher thought it would be a great idea to show off to the parents how good we were at looking up words in the dictionary. Every student could find any word in 30 seconds or less, which was very impressive. After that, my mom said I shouldn't wait till the end of the year to leave. So I left. I still remember leaving on my last day of school. For some reason, I was going home earlier that day. My classroom was in the very back of the building. At, the halls were almost completely empty as I walked down them one last time. I watched as more and more of the dully painted cinder block walls that I had known so well over the years passed by me. I thought about how this would be the last time I would see this place, a place that after all this time only ever gave me a desire to leave. A burden was finally being removed from me and it felt good. I joined South Jersey Sudbury School in January of 2016 and never looked back. <clears throat> oh, nice. Okay. Uh, part two, Sudbury. When parents ask at an open house, or, or when parents at an open house ask me about how new kids act when first joining Sudbury, I'll often say that there are two groups. Group one consists of kids who initially keep to themselves for a couple weeks and eventually start to open up. Then there is group two, who seem to almost effort effortlessly jump into the community and immediately start to learn about anything they might be interested in. Even though I'm introverted in a lot of ways, I definitely remember being part of group, one, uh, group two. In public school, it felt like I was in a straight jacket. I had such a passion and desire for learning, and Sudbury was finally the place that tapped into that. No longer was I restricted to what our Common Core textbooks said I should be learning. I started to write movie scripts and make terrible YouTube videos. I could learn what I wanted, when I wanted, and how I wanted. It felt amazing. I also remember experiencing a very rare feeling, one I can only compare to what I imagine it feels like to break away from an abusive relationship. For years, I had been in the same routine of waking up, spending my entire day in a place that in hindsight felt like a prison, doing homework for the rest of the day, then repeat. This cycle put me in a constant state of stress as school consumed my entire life, never having a chance to take a break and catch my breath. Even on Sundays, I would always get subtly anxious when remembering that I had school the next day. When I joined Sudbury, all of this was stripped away. A weight that was on my shoulders for so long, one that I might not even recognize was even there, gone. Quite often, I would feel a phantom stress on Sundays where I'd catch myself still thinking that I had public school the next day. It's not often that you feel anxiety, only to quickly realize that what was causing it in the first place was completely removed from your life. One aspect of Sudbury I immediately connected with was the strong sense of community. Most people in life will usually agree that community is important, but how many people, or let alone children, have actually experienced being in a true community? What's great is, that's exactly what Sudbury is, a true community. This element of the school is something I find incredibly valuable. Learning to function in and help maintain a free, democratic environment composed of a bunch of people of different ages and backgrounds is truly a priceless experience. The democratic element in particular, school meeting, was something I fell in love with pretty quickly. I still remember when I made my first rule. The school was still trying to find its footing, as the oldest student at the time was only 14. As such, this caused most school meetings to devolve into complete nonsense where most issues consisted of the 10 of us motioning to change the school's mascot or each other's nickname. <laughs> I don't think I've ever laughed more in my life. Since all these jokes uh, issues were disrupting the more legitimate ones, I had the ingenious idea of motioning to split the school meeting whiteboard in half, creating normal school meeting and silly school meeting. Real issues on one side and silly ones on the other. This was an objectively terrible idea. Of course, my motion passed. I was so happy. It just felt so empowering actually having an impact on my environment. That feeling gave me a powerful sense of ownership over the school. Whenever I or anyone else had an idea for a new rule or change of some kind, you could just go to school meeting and it would be discussed. If everyone liked your idea, we would vote on it and the change would be instantaneous. No longer did I have to worry about pr a principal blowing me off because I knew that any complaint, problem, or idea I had, no matter the quality, would always be heard. 
Here, I cared so much and I could do so much. The other element of the school that struck a chord with me was JC or Justice Committee. It was just so cool to me that there was an, a collaborative system for solving conflicts and rule breaking. Instead of a, an adult yelling at you, it was your friends and peers holding you accountable. This made you much more likely to actually listen and change your behavior. JC was also a, ro a rotating panel of people, so everyone got a chance to serve as a JC member as well. This system felt, like, felt so much less primitive than what I was used to in my previous school. Here, if someone broke, broke a rule, it was handled one-on-one -on -one instead of punishing everyone. No longer did I resent the way I was treated. No mm -hmm. Sudbury was the, at last the place that not only gave me a say, but also an ever-growing ever voice. It was like a light switch flicked on, and suddenly I became less shy. Being in school meeting at JC had pretty quickly, quickly taught me to be more outgoing and comfortable talking to people. In public school, it felt like I was taught the opposite. The teachers are your superiors who will be called Mr. and Mrs. and you must behave perfectly for them. The kids in the older grades are also better than you in every way and you will never get to interact with them. In Sudbury, those stigmas simply don't exist. <clears throat> it was a special time that first year the school opened. There was a beautiful childish innocence. Like I said earlier, the school only had about 10 students, all between the ages of eight and 14. We were all kids and that was okay. We were all allowed to be ourselves with all of our delightful, goofy immaturity. For the first time, I was somewhere where we were free to have true fun, something that was never valued in my old school. It was the kind of fun that goes beyond the type you get at Chuck E. Cheese, the kind of fun that can only come from being in a small recreation center at a camp in the woods, where you, part of, where you are a part of a small group of weird, unique kids and two misguided hipster millennials, <laughs> all tr trying to figure out what the hell this school was. I felt at home. And even though I'd only been at Sudbury for a few months, by the time the school year concluded, it felt like I'd been there forever. When the second year started, the school felt different. New kids had joined and the community changed to fit them. This was not a bad thing. In some ways, it made the school feel new. New people gave way to new friends, new ideas, and new ways of thinking. The school felt like it was maybe even slightly maturing. We still had a long way to go, but it was something. With every passing year, the school continued to change a little bit. As I and everyone else around me grew and matured, so did the school. I myself became more interested in movies and finally started to make terrible slash great ones of my own. <laughs> I even started to gain new interests like cooking and <clears throat> roller coasters. As a person, I would, occasionally, I would occasionally be stupid and make mistakes, but luckily I, don't have, I, I couldn't have been in a better place to make them than Sudbury. As a community, we started to make more sensible decisions in school meeting. This growing sense of maturity made us increasingly well-equipped to deal with new, more serious issues, ones that we hadn't dealt before. Younger kids also started to join the school, which made the student body well-rounded. These factors made the community feel much more robust. All this is to say is that the school was always in a constant state of change and uh, evolution. Change in its relation to Sudbury is something I'd like to delve into a little deeper as to me it's the best way I can communicate my experience of going to the school. Change is baked into Sudbury's DNA. A brilliant thing about Sudbury is how it's made to be a free-flowing organism. It develops and evolves based on who it's composed of. Old people leave and new people join. New people emerge as they shed their old selves, as they grow and change. What might have been or seemed like a good idea before may not fit the school and its community as it is now. Problems arise that might not have an easy solution. There are so many issues and improvements that can be made that we have to hold a school meeting twice a week. The school will never be perfect. It's designed that way, always making the community change and strive to be better. Sudbury also does a great job encouraging change on a personal level, and I think a lot about how it stimulated it in me. The easiest way the school did this was by simply giving me time and space. I had spent so much, I had spent so many hours in my previous school daydreaming about my real passions, but was never actually allowed to focus on them. In Sudbury, it was the exact opposite. All I ever did was focus on my passions, the things that I loved. To me, the ultimate and unforgivable crime of traditional school is not letting passionate people, which is most people, do what they love. By never putting me in a box, there was no limit to how far I could go. I could spend whole days deep diving into film, or cooking, or roller coasters, or graphic design, etc. There was never going to be someone telling me to go do something else. Because of this, I naturally became pretty knowledgeable and skilled in some of these subjects, while also being free to discover new ones. I've learned so much more at Sudbury than my, all my time at public school, simply because I was given the time to explore my own curiosity. 
The other obvious features of Sudbury that changed me in a profound way are school meeting and JC. I talked earlier about how they both affected me when I first joined the school, but their true impact has only grown over the years. School meeting made me more outgoing and, as stated earlier, gave me a voice. This voice grew stronger through growing, going twice a week for years. I learned so much about how to argue and make a case for my opinions, while also teaching me how to problem solve and make compromises. The feeling of ownership uh, for the school that I initially gained in school meeting evolved into a deep love and passion for Sudbury. This is why, over nearly, my, nearly eight years here, I've rarely ever missed attending an, a school open house. I deeply care for the school and actually want to see it continue to grow. This is what happens when you give kids a say and a vote. They become attached to the thing they've helped create. This is what keeps the school together, the deep love and care of everyone it's made up of, which is given to them by and mainly expressed in school meeting. JC has changed me as a, uh, as a person just as much, if not more, than school meeting. In it, I've been taught skills and lessons that a lot of, if not most adults, still don't know. I've learned about self-reflection and accountability. I've made mistakes and done many stupid things over the years, but JC has shown me that it's good to admit to being wrong sometimes and to take responsibility for my actions. Being written up is something that happens to everyone, and the times when it's happened to me have been some of the most humbling experiences of my life. They made me always strive to be a better person and to hold myself and the others around me to a higher standard. While serving on JC, I've had to find ways to deal with some really tough adult situations. On multiple occasions, I've suspended kids, and on even rarer ones, brought cases to school meeting with the intent of expelling the student. These instances have been huge moments for the school and my own growth as a person. When looking back from now to when I first joined the school, I'm amazed at how much I've grown and changed, all because of Sudbury. I can say with 100% certainty that I would not be even close to the same person I am today without this school. Not only did Sudbury change me into a much kinder, empathetic, passionate, capable person, it also allowed me to accomplish things that I simply couldn't have if I stayed in public school. This includes learning about all facets of video production and filmmaking, like screenwriting, storyboarding, directing, cinematography, editing, visual effects, sound design, film theory, and film criticism. <clears throat> as well as cooking, food science, photography, roller coasters, graphic design, website design, marketing, debate, logical fallacies, and veganism. <laughs> I also wrote, shot, edited, and directed countless short films, created many videos and advertisements for the school, did multiple freelance videography projects, while also working for my parents' company, creating videos and online courses, started my own company, nearly single-handedly created three school year yearbooks, as well as spearheading this year's yearbook <laughs> committee, <laughs> co-wrote and directed two school plays, helped plan nearly all school parties, organized this year's trip to Longwood Gardens, and also did a cross-country trip across India with my brothers and friend, all of uh, whom also attended Sudbury. I say all this not just to brag, but to also make a point. Most of these things I, most of these things I just wouldn't have made, been able to do, or at least to not the same extent, if I hadn't gone to this school. The truth is that the same curiosity and love of learning that drove me to do so much here would have been crushed in public school. My life would truly not be the same without Sudbury. <clears throat> Some tears might come soon. We'll see what happens. Oh God. <laughs> stop doing that. What am I doing? <laughs> Just stop it. Okay. There, there's like a, a firefight inside of the amp. Yeah. Um, part three, after Sudbury. I'm pretty dead set on being a filmmaker. For those who know me, this is probably no surprise. It's basically all I think about, for better or worse, and it's what I've dedicated the, the, dedicated the vast majority of my time learning about at the school. Over the years, I've made countless short films and videos of varying degrees of quality. Through creating them, I've gained a lot of experience about the process of making films, and I'm at the point where I'm genuinely proud of what I create. A few years ago, I started working with my parents as a videographer, making videos and online courses, as well as some freelance work. After Sudbury, I'd like to dedicate more of my time to videography with my parents, and through my new company I've started, creatively titled Daniel Marcus Films. Daniel Marcus Films, check it out! <laughs> However, uh, however, as much as I enjoy videography, my main goal slash dream is to write and direct feature films. This can be a reason why thinking about the future can be difficult for me sometimes. Directing is a hard job to plan for, as there's no set formula on how to become one. All my favorite directors have a different story of how they got their job, us usually involving some amount of luck. One thing that I have decided is to not go to film school. I think film school can be a great resource for a lot of people, especially ones who don't have a lot of experience with filmmaking. It can also be a good place to meet people and make connections. 
While in some ways that sounds appealing, I ultimately reali- I've ultimately, reali- ultimately realized that film school is probably, probably wouldn't be the best fit for me. I just can't really justify spending thousands of dollars on going to one when there are a seemingly infinite amount of amazing online resources like interviews, tutorials, video essays, etc. I've basically been putting myself through my own film school since the moment I joined Sudbury. It just simply doesn't make sense to me to go to one when I feel like I've learned so much just by myself, especially when degrees in filmmaking aren't really that well valued in the industry. Many great filmmakers, including James Cameron, Edgar Wright, Spike Jones, Quentin Tarantino, Christopher Nolan, Steven Spielberg, Greta Gerwig, Wes Anderson, Richard Linklater, and my favorite director, Paul Thomas Anderson, never went to film school. Right now, I'm much more interested in continuing to make short films and also getting jobs as a production assistant on film sets. I've done it a couple times already, including once for a major reality TV show, and I really enjoyed it. Doing this has already given me some great connections with other young filmmakers and people in the industry. In the end, I can never know what my future will be like. I've emphasized the significance of change in this thesis, specifically on how much I've grown over these past eight years. As I grow older, I'll continue to mature and change. I'll probably want different things for my life, and that's okay. Sudbury's taught me to embrace change. I don't want to stay the same person. I want to evolve. I want to be able to look back at myself now and say, look how much I've changed. I don't know what's going to happen in my future, but I trust that the skills I've learned from Sudbury will help me through anything. Epilogue. (laughs) <laughs> okay, ready? While writing this, I'm, I've loved looking back at my time at Sudbury. I'm still amazed that a school run by kids works so well, where every day, children run the Justice Committee, which is peer-to-peer conflict resolution, all by themselves. I'll sit in school meeting every day and watch as we have intelligent conversations about equality and fairness, while also motioning to create popcorn permits or make a school holiday celebrating a cat named Bodie. <laughs> it's moments like these where I think about how grateful I am I've gotten to a, go to a school like this. I think about for the past eight years, I've been able to focus on doing exactly what I love around people I love. I also think about how my life, how different my life would be if I stayed in public school. I think about how just like Sudbury, public school changed me. I think back to what my dad said, how I lost a part of myself when I started going there. After all these years, I can wholeheartedly say that that whatever was taken from me then has been more than given back to me at Sudbury. Thank you. I just want to thank that is my Oscar speech. Thank you everyone for coming. It means a lot to me. Um, thank you everyone who's come to the school and helped me make me who I am today. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thanks everyone. Yeah! I didn't cry. Yay! Oh my God, it's in a tin. Thank you. This is Brian, and I want to thank him for being the best staff member ever. This is all his fault, for better or worse. That's He's me. He's a bearded man now. A mustachioed, bearded individual. <laughs> I love the sound the, the rain makes on the tin. <laughs> We're all good. We're good. Thank you. Thank you, all right. Vegan roller coasters, everybody. Woo! What a world. All right, Daniel. Before it gets too saturated, let me have the honor of presenting you with your diploma. Oh my God! Woo! Thank you. <laughs> As you bend up, you better leave you This is what it looks like before it gets rained on. Yay! Thank you! Okay, let's get out of the rain. Thank you everyone so much! Thank you guys, thank you all for coming out. There's a new Daniel Marcus film, it's called DreamWorks.